do that for a while. How did you stay sane through all of that traveling? It just becomes natural after a while. Yeah, well, I I like travel, so yeah, I gained it's not the same I traveling gained... for leisure as like all the high pressure traveling for work and it was it wasn't ever high pressure. I, I was very good at um keeping it to a sane level. So I wasn't like very rarely was I doing something like three cities in three days. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was it was more often because even with like uh, Snowflake's data for breakfast, when I did three cities, it would be I, I flew up to Vancouver, I flew up to Calgary the day before the event. We did the event. The next day, we flew to Vancouver. And the day after that, so there was always a day in between. Snowflake was very good about you know, keeping a day in between on stuff like that when I was going to be the speaker in all three locations. Um, but most of the time, there was a lot of things spaced in between, you know, especially going to Europe. Uh, we'd go and do a, do a Snowflake user group meeting and then maybe have a couple of customer meetings. And then I might go to another town and, you know, have a, have a meet up there. Um, so it, 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 didn't, it didn't bother me, really. Um, I was, I didn't ever really suffer greatly from jet lag, um, learned how to sleep on the planes and get, get enough sleep in and, and eat, eat, eat well and taking emergency and vitamins all the time. And, uh, yeah, I feel like I need to get better about that. Anytime I travel, I'm just like out. I can't, I can't do it like that. I need to get better about it though. Cause I think we're going to be doing a lot more traveling with the team. A lot of good. Yeah. A, a lot of is, is adjusting to the dime zone, whatever it is. So, mm -hmm. you know, get there and stay up till normal bedtime and set the alarm and get up in the morning. And in a lot of cases, if the hotel has a, a workout room, then I would go at least do, you know, 20 minutes on a treadmill or a bike or something in the morning, mm -hmm. just to get, to get started and try to work that in. And I always force, think I'm going to do for, that. And I never do. <laughs> you, have, you just have to do it. You have to make a resolution. It's yeah. like New Year's resolution. Say, this is my travel schedule. And this is how I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. is, I, I did see. all that. And I still felt like I lost about 20 IQ points. from the <laughs> Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, if you don't sleep well, that's, that's a, that's, that's, that's the key is, is, is mm -hmm. getting to sleep. But I, I only sleep, you know, well, prior to this, it's like five hours a night was five to six hours was um, my my average. And now being retired, I managed to sleep seven. Try to go to bed at midnight and I get up about seven when sun gets up and then I go walk the dog. I walk the dog and listen to a podcast while I'm walking the dog and then come back and eat breakfast and go exercise or go work at the food pantry, depending on the day and where we are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want That's to retire. Great. That sounds like my dream life. Well, I did that a lot during COVID. That was the pattern I got into doing during COVID is I would get up, go walk the dog, come back. Um, when the weather was good, go ride my bike, do about five mile bike ride, eat breakfast, take a shower, and then get to work. And having people, most of Snowflake being on the West Coast, I didn't have a lot of you know, meetings before 9 a.m. my time for the most part. So that worked mm -hmm. out okay. And just it just made that a habit. And that's how I st stayed sane during COVID is, you know, basically got out every day and the dog needed to go out anyway. So <laughs> yeah, it helps a lot having a dog in a, in a time like that. Definitely. I mean, I don't know what I would have done during that without my dog. I would have probably gone crazy. Yeah. That's why there was, there was a lot of COVID puppies. Oh yeah. A, a lot of COVID of pets. <laughs> yeah. I feel like 99% of the people I knew who didn't have a dog do now after COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dogs I are believe good it. Now. <laughs> um, so we're going to go ahead and get started in a few minutes. We're going to go live first on LinkedIn on Anna's page, um, which I will configure and uh, then I'll start the webinar. So if we want to just, because uh, we're going to leave a few minutes, of course, for people to arrive. Um, so let's think of a fun topic to, to chit chat about. Um, and we can spend, you know, maybe like three minutes on that. 
Okay. Yeah, I have one in mind already. I was going to okay. ask, ask for Ken's background and like first seeing Data Vault and things like that. His gut reaction when he saw it with his like beginner that. eyes. I like that. That's great. Perfect. And then uh, we'll leave a couple of minutes for people to arrive. I'll enter you guys and then we'll go from there. And if I see some questions come in, um, I mean, hopefully we get some. Uh, I'll go ahead and stop you whenever I get a chance. If not, we'll leave them for the end. Um, but either way, I think it'll be fine. Sounds so uh, it's going on LinkedIn Live as well. So there may be mm -hmm. people asking questions over there that we won't see in uh, the Zoom or does uh, that pass through? It doesn't pass through. In the past, we haven't really gotten a lot of questions on LinkedIn Live. Just a lot um, of comments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just a lot of comments. And Anna kind of monitors those anyway okay. since it's on her page. Um, so I think we should be fine okay. uh, with those. Uh, and it's a, even if we get questions we're not able to answer, it's always a good excuse to kind of repurpose the content and bring back uh, this conversation about Data Vault. Um, so either way, I think it's great. Okay. Sounds yeah. good. Yeah. Anything else um, you guys might have questions about? I think we covered everything and you guys are pros at this at this point. So yeah. we're good. No, it should be no problems. Okay. Cool, cool. It's it's all it's all up to Surge to keep it moving along and asking me the interesting questions. Okay, <laughs> no I like pressure. it. No um, pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and start configuring the LinkedIn Live, which will you know it'll start a few minutes or maybe like one or two minutes before um, the webinar because I have to do it manually. It's kind of annoying. Yeah, uh, but. Oh gosh. And now my Slack is like not working. Okay. There we go. So just give me a couple minutes and I'll let you guys know beforehand. So. Okay. We'll be here. Good. Good. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm going to hit the go live button in a minute just so we don't have that much um, that much time in between. Okay. And we'll need a lot more uh, chit chat material, which I think we will have, but we don't want the uh, um, Zoom webinar people to miss that. So I'll just give it one more minute and then I will go ahead and start that and then we'll start the webinar. Sounds good. Okay. Here you tell you us go. when we start talking. I just hit the go live button. So, all right, here we go. It's being live streamed on LinkedIn. And I'll go ahead and start the webinar in just a minute as well. Um, and then we can start talking data vault. All right. Give it one more minute. And I'm going to check and make sure everything's good on LinkedIn. Looks good. Uh, we're on Anna's page. We're hoping to get lots of good comments on there. Okay, we have one more minute before we are starting the webinar on Zoom. I'm going to go ahead and start that now. Okay, here we go. Um, so Serge, I know you had uh, something you wanted to chit chat about before we get started with this masterclass. Um, so what was that about? It was about, given that Kent has about two decades of experience with Data Vault for almost as long as it's been around, Kent's been a part of it. And, but for many people joining this webinar, Data Vault is a completely radical concept. You know, they're used to building tables, they're used to managing facts and dimensions, but this is a whole nother pattern. These are whole different naming conventions. So before we're going to, you know, give a little, a little bit of uh, time for folks to join. So this isn't super technical, but I wanted to get Kent's, if he can recall 
his first impression on seeing Data Vault with beginner eyes, like many people on this webinar are going to see for the first time today, maybe. What did it look like? Did it take you some time to believe, or did you see this pattern and just say, "Wow, this is going to revolutionize data warehousing"? Yeah, it was. It was a little bit of both, honestly. I uh, and I'm trying to remember. I I had been following Dan prior to him publishing about data vault because he had uh the company he worked for at the time he invented this thing called the matrix methodology which was a a new approach to doing data warehousing and i had read some of what he wrote and was like hey this guy's you know got some really good ideas here and then uh, i saw the thing on uh, on data vault and his proposal that uh, this was going to be a new way of designing data warehouses that solved problems that we had seen in the prior decade with uh, the the third normal form approach that um, is attributed to Bill Inman and the dimensional star schema approach that was attributed to uh, to Ralph Kimball. And so, I, oh, okay, this is interesting because I've been doing data warehousing and design since the mid 90s. So somewhere along the line, I saw some of what he wrote and went, okay, this guy, he, he's he's not talking trash. Uh, what he's what he's talking about is true. Oh, I've seen I, I've seen every everything that he said he's encountered in his career that were problems I had encountered myself. And I'm like, okay, it would be great if we had a way to to solve some of these problems. So I actually went to a um, a live free lunch and learn. I happened to be working very near where where Dan's office was in Denver at the time. Went to this live lunch and, lunch and learn, went through the whole thing, the pros and cons and all of that. And I came out of it going, this might work. But being Just crazy I mean, enough be, to work. Huh? It, it, yeah, it was like it was different enough and it made sense mathematically to me. I had a really good understanding of normalization. And um, like I said, I had seen these problems that he pointed out. So uh, but I wasn't 100 percent sold. So I actually came back two weeks later to the same free lunch and learn and, and pelted him with questions. <laughs> and I think I was the only one in the room asking questions. You know, every, you know how people are. Everyone else was there for the lunch. They were there. They were there for the lunch. And they and I could tell a lot of people couldn't quite follow what he was saying. Um, and so I had. You know, got, I went to the same thing twice, right? Great mm -hmm. advantage. I'd seen the seen the material. I I had I had the slides, or it was printouts at the time, because uh, it was you know 2002, and uh, came back and and asked some you know I'll say relatively pointed questions, and he had good answers to all of them. And then I stayed after and started a conversation with him, and that was mm -hmm. kind of the the beginning of the whole thing. And that was yeah, that was 2002. Wow. Um, and he the, had just published the data vault, the four, four or five, I forget which it was, original articles about data vault had been published on the TDAN site in 2001. And so I had gone and read those articles uh, before going back the second time. Um, and that's that's all there was that was in writing about data vault at the time. Um, and then, you know, found out that he knew Claudia Imhoff and Bill Inman, who I already knew and had worked with um, starting in the in the mid 90s when I got started in my data vault my data warehouse career um, turned out Denver Colorado uh, was like the center of the universe for data warehousing and BI for some reason Claudia lived up in Boulder hence the Boulder BI brain trust that she founded and Bill lived in Castle Rock which was a suburb just south of Denver um, I lived in the mountains outside of Denver D Dan lived right in central Denver at the time um, and there was there was just bi data warehouse people all over the place and so we had all kind of crossed paths and you know bill was one of dan's mentors um cool. and and as even he's even talking at the uh he's going to be at the data vault conference again this year i think bill bill Inman's done keynotes for at least three or four of the worldwide data vault consortium events in vermont over the last 10 years um so he's uh Amazing. He's got Actually, a great, great, great affinity to uh, to Data Vault and, and Dan. Yeah, mm -hmm. looking forward to that. So we've actually got quite a few participants already joined, so we can get awesome. the show on the road. But just in just so we don't leave people in suspense, having heard about it, 
did you go off and knock one out of the park on your first try? Did it take some adjustments, some experimentation? Um, we actually, I was working at Denver Public Schools and we I had written, built a uh, state, I'll say a, uh, how did I call that? A, a third normal form operational data store, store that was um, source agnostic. So I had kind of gotten that idea already. And what I actually did is I was very interested in it. I pitched it to some of my team members. They thought it sounded interesting. We went back and took one of the very first Data Vault classes from Dan and then um, engaged him as a uh, as an advisor. And we went back and we, we built a Data Vault. Uh, we used the ODS as our staging area because we already had it built. So we, we fed it into the Data Vault um, and then built dimensional data models on top of it for the analytics. And then we had Dan coming in a couple of times a month to review our models and, and make sure that we didn't go too far sideways. Because I knew it was it was different enough that I didn't want to take the chance that we didn't do it right. Right. Um, and so that's why for 20 years I've been a proponent of the data vault training and having expert mentors and coaches helping you at least through your 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 first approach because uh, while it is simple in nature data is complex and so trying to map that complex data that you have and business concepts to hubs and links and satellites many times is not as easy as you might think it would be Mm -hmm. Exactly, which is actually a really good segue to having a data vault expert right here, having we're already getting questions rolling in. So maybe it's time for some introductions. I see people are hungry for this content. So let's jump right in, Sarah. Yeah, let's do this. Um, so as Serge mentioned, Kent has, you know, over 20 years of experience with this methodology, which, you know, puts him in a perfect position to be an expert on this masterclass. Uh, he's also the author of an introduction to agile data engineering using Data Vault 2.0. Um, and Serge also has decades of experience as well. Um, he's one of our own at SQL DBM. And these are people who are going to give you what you need as far as Data Vault goes. So we're really excited to get started. I have a question for for the two of you to kick things off. Um, what really made it click for you both um, with this methodology? What, what made it click in your mind? Well, maybe I can go first because my experience is not as extensive as Kent's. Um, in fact, I am at the stage that Kent was just describing when I asked him his earlier question of everything I've heard about Data Vault resonates with problems, issues, bottlenecks that I have seen throughout my data warehousing career as, as a data architect. So it makes sense intellectually. And having learned at least the basics of how it works, I'm not a data vault expert by any means. That's why I'm so eager as well to be here and, and ask someone who is and find out more. So this is really why I'm, I'm really curious to kind of having understood what the base layer of data vault looks like i want to ask some in-depth questions about some of the more advanced topics which we're going to get to in the second half of this hour but i'd like to hear ken's response to that uh the the thing that resonated with me the most was the idea that if you did this right and followed this approach you could all but eliminate re-engineering and having been doing data warehousing for about a decade already, when I got introduced to this, I knew, you know, the the requirements changed constantly. The business didn't always understand the data that well. They didn't understand even necessarily what they really wanted from a data warehouse. Uh, so I had spent a lot of time re-engineering and rebuilding things over the years. Uh, and so the idea that if we did this, that we wouldn't have to do a lot of that, um, that, that was, that was very exciting to me. It's like, you know, we, we can be productive. We can start building things. We can get the business what they want mm -hmm. and not have to be constantly um, spending time and money on the technical debt that resulted in requirements change, business rules changes, source system changes, that we could streamline that quite a bit. Um, and this was actually just pr prior to me getting introduced to Agile and some of the concepts in Agile that align with this really well. So that, that's really what did it for me. It's like, if we can save time and we can, we can eliminate work uh, that 
you know, that it's redundant and expensive and, and reduce our errors and build a resilient uh, data warehouse. That, that seemed to me like that would be, that was definitely going to be worth the effort. Mm -hmm. And you We're mentioned giving exactly the business. Go ahead, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you mentioned giving the business what they want. And we actually got a, a question already that that's very relevant to this. Um, but it, it's, it's actually not towards the business side. It's towards fellow architects. Um, when fellow architects don't really get it and it, it's not clicking for them, how do you uh, best describe it to them uh, to kind of help help them understand what the business value is? Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's a great question because the the way I try to term it when I'm talking to people about like, well, okay, what's so great about Data Vault? I said, mm -hmm. if you do it right, you build a source system agnostic semantic business model. It's a lot of words to say we're going we're gonna to build a design that's not tied to any of the source systems. So as things change, we're not going to break what we built. And it's based on the business terminology, the business ontologies, um, so that it, the, the concepts that are in the model, even though you know, your business people aren't necessarily technical, when you're having a conversation with them, you're going to be using the same ter terminology. You're going to be speaking their language. And that makes it a, so much more effective when you're trying to collaborate with the business to, to figure out what they want. I mean, uh, I, used to, I used to say all the time, you know, somebody would tell me, oh, man, they can't believe they changed. I said, just you have to remember, users lie. They don't do it deliberately. But, you know, they, they tell you what they think they need. And then when they see it, they go, oh, no, 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 that's that's not you, you missed all of this. It's like, OK, mm -hmm. well, we missed it because you didn't tell us. So uh, really being able to uh, build an architecture that allows you to roll with the punches and instead of having to say, OK, man, it's going to cost you six months now because you didn't tell me all that last week. Right. We don't want to do that. And uh, and it's kind of been one of the goals in the agile world is that collaboration with the business um, and the ideas in agile were great. But when it came to data, it's like, well, how do you do that with database design? Mm -hmm. And the two just came together so well. The the methodology and approach to building data vault um, designs allowed you to be agile, allowed you to do things incrementally and without boxing yourself into the cor into a corner. Um, and so that's really, that's the value that the value is really the lowering the total cost of ownership to the business by not having to do all this rework when they change their minds. And the secondary value, of course, is the, is you're reducing the time to value of them being able to use their data. Mm. Okay. So really we actually good. want to, we want to go deeper on a lot of those points, but we also don't want to assume any prior knowledge. So I think this is probably a good time to get down to basics and give a very simple explanation for, technically speaking, what is Data Vault? What are the principles? What are the design concepts, nomenclature, patterns? Is it a methodology? Is it a framework? Is it a set of rules? And for those who have no, no idea and are still comparing it to data lakes and, and things like that. And also, I think we've also milked the safe cracking vault entering concept enough. So I'm going to shed the disguise <laughs> and hand it back to Kent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, to start off with one of the misconceptions about data vault is it's a, it's just a data modeling technique. And while there is a data vault modeling technique and approach, the hubs, links, and satellites, et cetera, it is more than that. Uh, the, the official, I'll say title for it, is, is the Data Vault 2.0 System of Business Intelligence. And so it includes architecture, methodology, and modeling, right? And so just like, you know, in the Agile world, you've got Scrum and Kanban and all of these other approaches, um, there, there is a methodological approach based on repeatable patterns, uh, based on uh, the CMMI maturity model. Uh, there's some Six Sigma buried in there. Uh, something from Scott Ambler called, um, it's, it's, uh, it's dad. Now I got to remember what it was. I just lost my mind there. It's, uh, <laughs> It's like it's his agile methodology that he uses for databases. It is really all about that. But then you again, you have the modeling, but then you have the architecture that it's it's generally a three tier architecture. 
exactly like Bill Inman's corporate information factory. And this is why Bill Inman got on board with this is we're still thinking you need a staging area, you know, persistent or transient is dependent on your requirements. Um, these days people use data lakes, right? And a data lake can be a persistent staging area to feed your data warehouse, or in this case, which would be the data vault structure. And so that's your second level is the data warehouse piece of it, um, which is going to be your time variant historical repository of all of your data uh, conformed and integrated across business lines and, um, and business keys, as we'll talk about in a bit. And then the third layer is your, infor we call it the information mart layer, uh, rather than data marts, we call it information marts, because uh, it's not just data, we're trying to give the business value as we build that out. And the information marts could be in the form of dimensional models. They could be third normal form. If somebody's needing to do operational reporting, uh, it could be flat wide. It could be, you know, a 2000 um, column feature set for a data scientist. All of those things go into that third layer. And so we get all of that together. So it's, it is done properly is well beyond just the, the data modeling aspect of it. Okay, that's actually, that's a really good introduction. And we're going to jump into a little demo that we prepared in just a little bit that's going to cover the the pieces, the links, hubs, and satellites that some of you may have heard of. But I once heard a wise man say that to prepare for building a data vault, you should start with a conceptual model. Kent, do you, do you have any idea who that wise man was? I have no idea. <laughs> Who was that? It was every everybody in the data vault world now is, kind of says that. So uh, Dan says it, I say it, uh, John Giles says it. Uh, there's quite a okay. few of us that say, let's you know, let's start. You very, start at the business level. <laughs> very modest of you. Yeah, this was taken from one of one of your blogs actually. So <laughs> let me let me share my screen so people have an idea of what we'll be working with. So the little little demo we prepared is actually based on the AdventureWorks sample data set from Snowflake. So before we get into Data Vault, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, this is uh, if you have Snowflake. In fact, Databricks, a lot of um, data warehouses use this. No, it's, sample. it's actually just a correction. It's the TPCH data data model, I believe, rather than AdventureWorks. That's the old yeah. SQL Server model. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, it's a very simple structure. You have a customer, you have orders, you have line items, parts. So it's it's just a basic retail schema. And this is what we're going to be building off. So as, as Kent mentioned, uh, Data Vault starts with the business model. It's just putting agile methodology and warehousing principles on top of an agile business model and an agile way of working. So this is the schema that we'll be building. And let me jump to our data vault project so we can describe some of the pieces that are involved in the data vault methodology. So what we've what we've done actually in preparing for this is we've built a mini data vault with both the raw layer, the business vault, the information mart layer and we're going to explain each of these in detail so we've kind of got one big diagram in layers of starting from the staging area to the raw vault to the business vault and we're going to start there i think that is the well maybe kent maybe you want to go through some of these just to tell uh, he, let people know what they'll be what the what the right i think i think you know we, we kind of mentioned we the into raw vault yeah, we mentioned kind of the the architecture a little bit, you know, so having a staging layer and that is really your that's your raw data being loaded into the platform. Um, and you can have all kinds of debates about what that looks like, but mostly it looks like the source data. Um, then the raw vault layer is your uh, hubs, links and satellites based off of the business model, but also with uh, mappings to your source data. And we'll talk about that in, in some more detail. And then the business vault layer is where we start applying some of the business rules and creating additional objects that um, 
will help add value to the information in the raw vault. I mean, raw vault is exactly what it sounds like. It It's the source data. You should be one of the rules in data vault is if you know you've done your data vault right, if you can recreate the source system data by querying the raw vault with the appropriate joins and everything. Uh, if you can't recreate the grain of transactions and recreate the input data by querying your raw vault, then you did something wrong in the design of your raw vault. And the business vault is where we start applying some of the rules, maybe aggregations, some master data management, and a number of other things that uh, Serge and I will get into in a, a little bit. And then the information delivery layer is, as I said, that's going to be how you, I say, project that data vault data in a form that's consumable by your end users, whether they be data scientists, Tableau developers, Power BI developers, um, somebody who just wants to watch, write SQL, uh, somebody wants to load it into a spreadsheet, you know, whatever that is. And so that information delivery layer is where, you know, using today's data mesh terminology, you might say that's where your data products are going to be that are, are built specifically for data consumers. So uh, where do you want to start? You want to start, the, start with the raw vault and just take a quick look at some hubs and satellites for the, the basics? Exactly. I think that's, that's a great introduction. So let's start with the raw vault and explain what are the pieces, what are the elements that users are likely to find in a raw vault? Right. So uh, hubs. That's the, you know, I hate to use the word key, but it's the key to the whole thing is if you don't get your hubs right, your your, your data vault's probably not going to work out. And so the the hub represents a business concept in any relationship modeling. We would call it the, the business entity. Right? so the example uh, Serge is showing here is hub customer. So everybody's got customers. One of the things about data vault, though, is it is a it is a repeatable methodology with standards. And so what you see here at the top, you have the SHA-1 hub customer. So that's a that's a hashed primary key. And this is one of the innovations in data vault 2.0 is we went to using hash keys because there was so many disparate um, types of database systems and Hadoop and all of that, we, we were trying to find something that would work across all and be consistent. So SHA-1, MD5, those are standard algorithms for, for creating you know, a value that's repeatable. And so that's why we went to that uh, instead of surrogate keys, in part because on MPP type boxes like Teradata and Oracle, and Snowflake, you wanted to. We wanted to eventually be able to load massive amounts in parallel. Well, if you if you're single threading on a integer surrogate key generator, it's going to slow down your loads. And so that was another reason for eliminating the integer key as a primary key on hubs. And now below that, you see a C cust key with an AK next to it, which in SQL DBM that means alternate key. That's the business key. So a business key is the key to the entire data vault. This is the thing that gets it right or wrong is the business key should be, you know, a attribute or set of attributes. It can be multiple, it can be multi, multiple attributes together that to the business people represent this object, whatever it is. Now, in this case, we have a customer key because that's the sample model we were working with. That, Surrogate keys from the source system are generally not a good idea to be business keys for data vaults. And the reason for that is so many, you know, surrogate keys, they're just integers. And if you have four or five customer systems and they're not linked together and they're independent, say different regions, different subsidiaries of your company, you know, there's a customer 25 in all of them. And that's not the same customer. So while we did this for expediency because we're working with this TPCH, you know, using a surrogate key is not, is it's an anti-pattern in data vault, really. It, it should be a set of attributes that uniquely define whatever the object is you're looking at. Um, mm -hmm. And then, then you have, you see LDTS, so that's load date timestamp, and RSCR, which is record source. So these are standard metadata attributes that are included in every data vault object. So we have the hash primary key, 
And in a hub, you always have the clear text business key made up of multiple attributes that uniquely define this thing. Uh, and in fact, the hash key is calculated based on you know, applying an algorithm to those business keys. And then the low date timestamp, which is the, the time when a single record is loaded into the hub. So it might not be the create date on the source system. And that's fine. That's that's a whole different conversation. But it is when did it arrive in the in the data vault? Because this is part of our auditability so that we know when somebody runs a report at this time, we can go back and say, what did the data look like in the data vault at that time? Exactly. Um, so there is a, the create date is an attribute of customer and there are no attributes in a hub. Correct. Yes, there is no dependent attributes in the hub. The only thing in the hub are, as, as we said in when we used to do uh, talk about voice code normal form, the key, the whole key, and nothing but the key. Now, of course, again, we have some metadata because we, we want to be auditable as well. That's one of the goals of Data Vault is full auditability. Now you say, okay, if I got three source systems and I've got surge in all three source systems, well, what goes into that record source? The the reference to the source system that we first learned about Surge as a customer, whether it's source system one, two, or three, and it'll depend on how you onboard uh, and, and the timing of your loads. You know, if there's Surge has been added to three separate systems, and maybe he got added to one yesterday, he hasn't been added to number two and number three, you know, he was added two months ago. Right? So depending on when we ran the process, it might be that the record source for Surge is hub record shows source three because it was in there first. And that's, you know, that's kind of a, one of those things that we uh, we track, but we're, this is the point of integration. So it doesn't matter per se that it's in all three systems, but it does matter. We want to track which one knew the system first. And what Dan discovered very early on is that often people would look at that and they they go to the history. It's like, well, why? We shouldn't have got that record from that source. Well, why not? Well, because that's not the master. Well, you got a process problem in how you are processing the data in your company. And so it's uncovered data quality issues by doing it this particular way. Okay. So now so down we've covered one object, but we've already got one key insight that we can derive from a hub, which is just a standard count, a distinct count of our dimension, in this case, customer. Right. Yes. Yeah. Eventually in the dimensional world, this would turn into kind of the basis for a dimension. Yeah. So here, because you're only loading it once, right, based on the business key, this is where you go to get your distinct customer count, mm -hmm. right? Instead of triple counting it because it's in three different sources, right? Uh, so below that, then we have the satellites. So the satellites, uh, whether they're off of a hub or a link, is where you put the descriptive data. And so the descriptive data are the attributes that are fully dependent on that business key. So for those of you who are into the geeky normalization stuff, hubs are basically six normal form and satellites are third normal form because hubs only have keys and no attributes. And so we've fully normalized here. And this is part of what gives Data Vault its power and its flexibility is we're down at the lowest level of grain, right? Relationship wise. Um, so here we have, you know, sat source, uh, the one on the left, the sat customer source two that has the name, address, national code, um, hash diff, and record source. So the unique thing about satellites is satellites, I used to say, this is, this is where the data warehouse stuff really happens. This is where you do your change data capture. And so you'll note there that the primary key of the satellite is the hub key and a load date timestamp. So every time we run our processing, whether it's daily, weekly, hourly, or minute by minute, if something changes for, you know, we'll say Surge's record, we, we, we notice something different, the address changed, the nation code changed, something like that, we're gonna insert a new record into that satellite. And so we're gonna keep a full history like a type two slowly changing dimension. And so early on, Dan, Dan always said that, you know, to a certain extent, Data Vault is kind of a hybrid of third normal form and has aspects of dimensional modeling as well. well this is where that comes in uh, because we're tying it to the date. So we can track every single change and never lose any history, which 
turns out is very important to most businesses, even though when you start out your initial requirements, they might say, oh, no, we don't we don't need we don't need history. Well, the data vault methodology mandates that you do it because in the end, somebody's going to need history. Every time a, a customer told me they didn't need history, they came back a month later and said, oh, we really need to see those changes. And if we didn't have a persistent staging area, we couldn't rebuild that history. So the data vault methodology builds that into the methodology. By definition, we are going to track history. How often we track history will be the conversation. Okay. Can There's actually a question that I think Kent is going to love, and it's yeah. specific to satellites, but I think it's important to address this here because it, it ties to the broader data vault concept as a methodology. So the question is from Badu. It says, Hello, uh, do we still need to have hash diff column in satellites when my source is already giving me change data, SQL Server, CDC? And the answer is, is yes. One of the, the values of standards and methodology is that it gets applied universally. It reduces your cost from a training perspective and it allows you to use automation code automation frameworks that generate to the data vault standard. So yeah, it's great that the source system has it. That source system has it. What about the next source system you get that doesn't have it? And you've got to do these uh, hash diff calculations yourself. And so for those that don't know, he jumped right into something. Obviously he knows what a hash diff is based on his question. You know, hash diff is we're actually going to take those three attributes, name, address, nation code, and put them together using uh, in this case, we're going to use the SHA-1 hashing function and create the hash diff. And so when we go to load the satellites, we're going to compare the hash diff rather than doing a whole bunch of ORs and saying, you know, if name is different or address is different or nation code is different or phone is different or whatever, then, then we load the road. We just go, we calculate the hash diff on the inbound side, compare it to the hash diff that's already there and go, is it the same or not? If it's the same, we don't need to load another record because nothing's changed. If it's different, then we do load one. They said in the in the case he's saying, if your source system is is feeding you, is doing the change data capture, then yeah, technically you don't need it. But the thing with Data Vault uh, that we've learned over the twenty years is if you start varying with all these what ifs, well, now you just made the design more complicated because now you can say, well, for this satellite. Does the source do the change capture for me? And that slows down your process and makes it harder to automate it. And again, it makes it harder to uh, achieve your goals because what if the source changes or what if the what if the CDC stuff breaks on your source? Well, now you're stuck. Now you've lost your changes and you can't get your changes because you built your data vault expecting that CDC. So this is this is part of the engineering to allow you to minimize your technical debt. Excellent okay. question. Yeah, exactly. Um, should we cover the last piece of the of the raw vault? The puzzle, yeah. The 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 links. So links are the relationships between hubs. And again, the example here just shows two hubs. So we're having the uh, link customer order is our, our really is going to be the transactions ultimately. Uh, between a customer and the customer order. So we're tying them together. So rather than a foreign key from order to customer, so there's never hub to hub connections with foreign keys. Because again, you get a source system where that foreign key isn't there. Now you have to re-engineer. And this would happen in third normal form all the time. We get a new source system. We'd have a massive entity that had five foreign keys in it already. And we get a new source system that's a relationship that we didn't have before. Well, now we've got to add a column to that table and we've got to change the ETL to load that table. That can be a lot of re-engineering. Yeah. So we've abstracted that out into people call this a many-to-many -many entity, they call it an intersection entity. In Data Vault, we call it a link. And it really is a uh, an instantiation and representation of the relationship at the lowest grain between these objects. And like I said, you can have, you have to have at least two to have a have a have a link, uh, but it could be a recursive relationship. That's another one of the more advanced ones. Is there's a recursive links. So if you've got a hierarchy of customers, you could have a link that is linking the customer to the customer, and those are the two components. And build your that's how you build hierarchies and represent hierarchies inside of Data Vault. Uh, but you could have three, four, five, six, ten. I've I've seen links that had ten hubs that came up with the proper grain 
of, of the relationship that, you know, all 10 components are necessary for the business relationship to be valid. And so you can see that. So you, so you don't have to have only two. Um, you can have as many prop, as proper when you get into data vault training. We talk about unit of work. Say, what's the real unit of work here that represents the relationship between all this data? So the good news here is if you, as you're building, this is part of the incremental agile approach is, you know, you've got your hub customer and you're, you're going along and you're, you've got a distinct count of customers. You've, you're tracking attributes about the customer. Uh, and then you've, you've built your hub order or potentially hub product is another one that's out there. Uh, you can add links at any time, right? Because you're not changing anything. So it's all very additive. So you could you could do a sprint where you're you're building your customer hub and maybe loading two sources in it and have two satellites like our example. Uh, and then the next sprint, you you you're or you maybe even it's a parallel team working in parallel, building the hub order. And then the second sprint is the two teams come together and like, okay, we need to you know populate the the relationship now between the customers and the orders. And so that's part of the power of this, to be able to build it incrementally. You don't have to know all the questions. You don't have to know all the sources to start building a data vault. The thing you do have to understand, though, is the business semantics so that you get those business keys right. Okay. This actually leads into one of the questions that I was just looking at from the audience from Anonymous. Um, if you have business keys for the same business entity that exists in multiple source system, and can these be in a single hub or separate hub for each source? And my thought would be some single hub, a separate satellite. So that, that is, that's the right answer. That is the right answer. Yeah. It's like, yes, sing, single hub. If you scroll back down again, as you see with a uh, hub customer, that's what we're representing there. We have SAT customer source one and SAT customer source two to exactly represent that. Um, one of the early, early data vaults I did with a Snowflake customer years ago, uh, I went in and they had, they were telling you, it's like they're having this horrible time with their data vault, trying to trying to get the data out. And it's just a big, 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 big problem. And I started looking at the model and they had three customer hubs and I asked them why. I said, well, we have three source systems. Say, well, what's the business key for customer? And they had three different business keys and they were all surrogate keys from their source. It's like, well, we call that a source system data vault, which as I said earlier, is an anti-pattern because in the end they had, to, they built a link table to try to map those customers to each other. Well, just like with a type two slowly changing dimension where you need a durable key to figure out what the changes are and to do a conform dimension, you know, how do you do that? If you've built hub, three different customer hubs, well, how do you know which one is which? Well, that's the business key, right? You get down to all I need to know, name, address, social security number, and phone number, and all three systems have that. And if those match up, it's the same customer. Okay, that's actually the business key. That should have been the business key for your one hub customer that had then three satellites off of it. Exactly. This is why we started the data vault presentation with a model of the conceptual business model. So all of this needs to be agreed upon and understood, agreed with the business, agreed with the stakeholders of what is an actual customer. What? How do we understand a customer as an organization before you can start modeling? And another question that was actually just asked was regarding foreign keys and primary keys in cloud data warehouses and data warehousing systems, why use them, when to use them. And I guess I, I can probably take this one since it's not data vault specific. Everything that we're looking at here, this, this diagram that is helping us understand our data vault design for this simple example, visually, the same thing if I was to explore this schema in Snowflake, in this case, if we're talking Snowflake or any other database, the keys, whether they're enforced or not, that's really, if you build it right, you don't really need to enforce them. That's just extra extra processing on, on the platform side. But think of it as, as extra metadata, just like you have metadata columns, you also have metadata relationships. They allow you to explore, reverse engineer, and visualize exactly how these tables relate to each other. Because we have, I think, eight tables in this example, and each table has a hub, a satellite, or more. 
there's going to be link between hubs so very quickly that's going to start to add up and if you're not maintaining that even if you're following a pattern you can kind of deduce if you have a stage customer or something you'll have a hub customer but it's going to become overwhelming so by all like I strongly suggest make use of the primary keys and foreign keys if your database platform supports them and most do so Azure is a little wonky with foreign keys but most database platforms support them even if they don't enforce them and they're always a good idea I agree 100 yeah. <laughs> percent yeah, I mean that that's that's a toss-up and speaking of questions uh, by all means ask them in the Q&A this way it allows us to, to track what's been asked and what's been answered uh, we will try to take some if they if they spur the conversation and what we're covering and then we're going to save some time towards the end for anything that we don't get to we'll try to get as many as we can we covered raw vault are we ready to move on to business vault uh yeah I think the, the the only other thing I'll say on the raw vault is it, you'll recognize in the links satellites and hubs they all have low date timestamp they all have record source and that's 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 the uh it, that's the minimum metadata required along with the the hash keys for joining everything so yeah so let's move on to business vault okay so business one vault. yeah one of the misconceptions about business vault I'll talk and I'll start off with now is people got the impression that for a business vault, you you replicated everything in your raw vault. And so you, you may have hundreds and hundreds of tables, and they would like just create a different schema and replicate all the tables over there and, and maybe make some changes. And that's actually not the case. Business vault is 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 a is a concept of how do we apply business rules? Uh, in the old days in data warehousing, we scrub data on the way into the warehouse. Well, in, in data vault, we don't. We we load the raw data in. So, you know, take taking a, a an idea from the uh, the data lake world, which actually came after data vault. Um, we're going to have the raw data raw, so that we can trace it and we know what came from the source system, because the source systems change over time. So we need to know, you know, for auditability and compliance. Many times we got to be able to trace back to what did we actually load. Well, in the old days, when I started in data warehousing, you could never tell what was actually loaded because we changed it all in ETL. We extracted it, we transformed it, then we loaded it. Data Vault flipped that around and said, no, we're going to load all the raw data, so it's ELT. We extract it, we load it into the platform, and we don't start transforming it really until we get to the business vault layer. And so there's a number of things that we we can do in what would be considered a business vault is where we, we might be applying some master data management rules uh, where we had those satellites that had multiple attributes in them. Well, which attribute comes from which satellite? That's a question. And, and how do we expose that to the, the business users? Uh, we may be doing calculations. We have a thing called a calculated satellite. Well, that calculated satellite hooks to the hub. There, you don't replicate the hub in a different schema and, and tie your calculated satellite to that you know, or any derived attributes, any of that. And we're still using the original hub in the, in the raw vault. And so that's a little, little bit of a, there's, well, actually not a little bit, there's a lot of confusion about that, right? So people are like, wow, you know, I've got a, a two terabyte data, data warehouse and you're telling me I've got to replicate all those tables to build a business vault? Nope, that's absolutely incorrect. And in fact, the example that uh, that Surge has here with our modern platforms with the speed that they have, much of what we did in Business Vault can be done with views, right? We can create views on top of the raw vault in order to represent what we need to do. Um, the, one of the original intents of um, Business Vault was if you say you have calculations that you need to do off of your raw data. You want everybody to use that same calculation. So we instantiate that in a business vault object. So whether it's uh, you know, total sales, some sort of a decode, calculation, things like the, of that nature. Or in, in this case, I think uh, yeah, what he was just showing there, we had we, we had some joins. We have some translations of codes going on. Some cases we're just we want to see just the the current record because we have all the history in the in the raw vault, and we just want to see the current record in the business vault. All those sorts of things are done in business vault 
structures so that when people build information marts, they're not recalculating it. Because we all know how we ended up with data silos. Because you had three different data marts, three different sets of programmers, and all of them needed some of the same data, except they derived it differently. And so you had conflicting answers. So our solution in the data vault world is this business fault thing. If it's a if it's needed by for more than one purpose, we calculate it once, we derive it once in the business vault. And that's what gets exposed to whoever is developing the information marts. Yeah. And just to give folks some idea in terms of who's accessing these layers. So we were just talking about the raw vault, which is the data team only, no reporting, no users in the raw vault. In the business vault, you start to see users, but only power users, power users who are comfortable bridging tables together, making joins. But again, with standardized business logic where it exists, like we're seeing in this example. So remember, there's still another layer, which is the information delivery layer that feeds reporting, that creates dimensions and fact tables for users to just plug in and consume. So also keep in mind in terms of which level of competence, which, which user profiles are going to be accessing the different layers of your data vault architecture. Yeah. And, and, and we've always said that you generally you never wanted to expose the, the raw vault because the business vault model, as you can see, will have a lot of objects and compared to what comparison to many reporting models would have. And so it, it can be too complex for most end users, but you may have data scientists. You may have some really advanced uh, data analysts who can write SQL right off the top of their head. Uh, so this is one of those, you know, business case, it depends scenarios. In general, you don't want to have it exposed. You want to have it locked down. Uh, but I found in the world of data science, uh, many data scientists understand graph models. And if you give them, you zoom out on the data vault model, it basically looks like a graph model with the hubs and the links in particular, um, that being uh, edges and vertices. And then the attributes being there. So, so there's, there's a little give and take there, but again, it requires understanding the use case, um, understanding security, understanding the actual requirements, and understanding the skill set of the consumers before you decide to expose any of these things at the various layers. The, uh, the plus side of all of it is it gives you multiple levels of security, right? You got lots of, lots of layers to... We haven't even talked about doing, you know, dynamic data masking and row access policies and all of that, because that, of course, can all be applied to all of these. Some of, you, in fact, you know, some of your business vault objects could be views that apply things like Snowflake's dynamic data masking, uh, row access policies limiting certain roles to how many what rows they can see. That would be something you would do in the business vault. Right. Exactly. And what other objects? We already covered views and some of that business logic, but what other uh, objects can users expect to find in a business vault that might not exist in, in a raw vault? Uh, pits and bridges. So point point and time tables and uh, bridge tables. So I've got one the example of yeah, the point and time minute. table. Yep. There, good job. All right. So a point and time table is not a requirement. It depends on your, your platform and what you're trying to do. But it, generally, if you have more than one satellite on a hub, you know, a point in time table, as we used to call this a query assistance table. So you can write a lot of, and I, I've got some in my book and a couple other places, I've written some of the code to compare it, is you could write a view and write a query that pulls data from both of these satellites uh, but given they may be loading at different times, you know, the load date timestamps may be different. So you, you want to know, what did it look like three days ago? Well, there might be a, a new row has already come in on one satellite, and the last record on the other satellite was five days ago. So there's some, I call it date gymnastics. You know, you got you to you really understand date logic in order to get the betweens and all of those sorts of things to, to line up easily. Uh, your other option is though you, you build this pit table where every time you load a new row into one of the satellites, you add a new row into your pit table. So you have you see here you've got the the hub customer SHA one. So you got the the hash key for really the hub, and you've got a pit load date. That tells me when did we put this this uh, 
row into the pit table. And if you do, this is what I call a historicized pit table. You know, you, you're doing it on a regular basis. So you can really go in and say, run the query where pit load date equals X. Well, on pit load date equals X, you've got a uh, source one load date and a source two load date. So then you can do equijoins using those load dates out of the pit table back to your satellite table. And it eliminates all of the, you know, leads and lags and betweens. And, you know, the, the low date is greater than or equal to this low date, but less than or equal to that date and all that kind of logic that you have to do. It just simplifies the logic. And in most platforms, it also means that the query is going to run faster because there's less logic in your predicates. Um, so that's, that's the, the main reason for that. Now, if you only got two sats, you know, arguably you could probably build, build a view that that'll work on that, but it's still going to have a little logic in it. Uh, Certainly when you get to three, four, and five sources, that means you got three, four, or five satellites off of any given hub. You're going to want to use pit tables because it just it simplifies the SQL that you're going to use. And okay. again, that SQL then is going to be embedded in your, hopefully, in your business vault views. So again, you're going to obfuscate that logic and that complexity from your downstream users, but the pit table is the thing that allows you to do that. Bridge and table. I don't think we have. Bridges. I don't think we have an example of a bridge table in here. We we don't, but they're similar to links, but different. So maybe if you could right. just briefly explain how they're different, folks might get the idea. Sure. So um, bridge tables work are very useful if you have a link that has three, four, or five hubs components in it, and your reporting requirement is I've got to pull attributes from the satellites off of those hubs, as well as perhaps satellite records off of the link itself. And it works exactly the same. You're going to use, you know, you're going to have a, you're going to have a, the, the hash keys for those hubs and the load dates for the satellites. So you're going to go direct to the satellites and basically allow you to bypass traversing from the link out to the hubs and then out to the satellites. And, and of course, if you've actually got pit tables because you got multiple satellites that adds to the fun as well as you may be your bridge table may actually point to a pit table as well that already resolved the joins for the multiple satellites but they're basically they're they're shortcuts they're shortcuts so you don't have to go you know down the chain and, and join from the link to the hub and then the hubs to the sats and then do all that logic there that you can just build a bridge table that points directly to it and again it's use case based so you don't build these just to build them. If I've got a link with, with five hubs on it, well, I my use case might be that I actually only need information from four of those hubs. So my bridge table points to satellites off of four of those hubs, but not the fifth one. And you get a new requirement. Okay, you might build a different bridge table. And then that's part of your business wall. And that's how you're applying the rules and how you can be very incremental about this. Um, we... It is not a best practice to go build pits and bridges on everything. You only build them when they're required to either improve performance or to solve a particular business problem. Okay. Um, I want to actually highlight a cool feature of Data Vault, which is actually a, an even cooler feature of Snowflake, which is multi-table inserts and just the general idea, even if you're not using Snowflake and you don't have multi-table inserts, just the fact that this is how Data Vault architecture allows this sort of load pattern and how it saves on ETL costs. So what is it about Data Vault that makes, first of all, what is it? What is multi-table insert and how does it simplify Data Vault loading? Yeah. So, so have, uh, for example, one task that loads off of stage orders, it loads simultaneously the satellite order, the hub order, and link customer order. Yeah. And so that allows you uh, the, with the Snowflake multi table insert, allows you to write one select statement to access the data from the stage and multiple inserts to these different tables. So it actually will do it all in parallel. That means you're only going to pull the data once from the stage table rather than the traditional way, which would be I've got three different insert tasks that could all indeed probably run in parallel, but each one of them is then going to access the data and, and pull it mm -hmm. rather than 
you know, doing it just once, which is the way uh, Surge has this up here with the multi-table insert. And you uh, you really want to use it when there, there's a lot of conditional logic. So things like looking at the hash diff, um, you know, making sure that the uh, the the hub record is there or not there. So it's standard, and there's standards for these and templates for these in in um, the data vault books and the data vault training on how you go about inserting. So uh, in the Oracle world, I use not exist all the time. So I would do it, you know, select from the stage table, insert into hub order where the order key not exists, right? I do a not exist comparison. So I'm only going to load it in if it's not there. And then on the uh, SAT orders and, and the links, all we do the same thing on the SATs. We use hash diff, say, is it there? Is it not there? Is it the same? Is it different? And so you can put that conditional logic actually into uh, case statements inside of the multi-table insert. Okay, let's let's try and get through some audience questions. I know we yeah, have you a, only got a couple a minutes of left. Time yeah, left. <laughs> but time flew. We've got quite a few, exactly. And we didn't even yeah, we're, we're going to skip. I think uh, the information delivery and the data marts altogether. So let's let's just take these in in chronological order. So we got one from Keith Evans. How would you handle change to the source where the satellite exists? Would you add a new satellite or change the existing? Uh, yeah, yeah. So when you say change the source, I assume you mean something like either they added or dropped some columns. Um, that one, it's you can add if it's just a couple of columns, then I would just alter the satellite and, and add it. And you know, and that's your your current loads will work as long as you don't make those mandatory. Uh, so you can you can alter the table and then and then change the insert process uh, to accommodate those two um, the two new attributes. If it's more than that, then I would generally just add another satellite because otherwise you start running into questions of like, hey, how come this row doesn't have those two attributes? Well, okay, well that row doesn't have those two attributes because we loaded the data before the source system was changed. And so then you've got, you know, a little bit of a mystery going on in, you know, why some rows have the data and some rows don't have the data. Um, but in, in general, that's kind of what I see people tend to do. Um, the, the simplest way to keep things compartmentalized, of course, is to, is to add a new satellite, uh, especially if it's more than, than, than two attributes. Okay, so just before we continue, I'd just like to give ourselves kind of a pat on the back for covering both the basics of how to get started, what it is, and the raw vault, as well as business vault, all in one in one session. So that's no small feat. And that was kind of the main goal. I think we totally, we expected ahead of time, we weren't going to get through every question, and we're going to save these. We're going to do a future webinar that Having covered the basics, we can get to specific use case concerns, questions, comments from the audience. So don't feel bad if we don't get to your question. We will be doing another session. So let's try to get a few more if time allows. So next question is, what is and what is the reason for an SAL, same as link table? Uh, okay, same as link table. That is because we all know data is dirty. And even though we've got a business key, Surge's name could be spelled differently, even in the same system, right? So we do our best to accommodate this. Especially and, my last name. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no kidding. Yeah, that's. I, I've seen about five different spellings, even for my last name, which is way easier to spell than yours. At least I think it is. But, but the same as link is the thing that allows you to do the equivalence, right? It's It, it looks like a recursive link, but it really is designed to say you know, this spelling, you know, this business key is the same as this business key, which is a separate row. And that, of course, requires, that's not something that you can automate easily. Um, you have to have somewhere, somebody's got to do that mapping. But that then allows you to run reports. You can build business vault views that resolve that recursion and say, I want to know all the information about surge that we have in the customer record over time, regardless of how we spelled his name, because we know it was spelled wrong three times. And so you can use that same as link then to join up those rows and, and traverse down to your satellites to get all that information, to, to pull out the full history 
of changes that have happened to Serge's record in whatever source system, regardless of how his name was spelled. But somewhere you've got to have that logic. Somebody's got to say, well, how, how do we do that? And that is, it's effectively, it's a mapping table. Um, I've been places where people built little apps uh, for the end users and, you know, on the same as link and it's, you know, got some drop downs and they go in and they, 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 they pull up the, the list and go, okay, yeah, there's that one. Yep. Yeah, there's that one ding and save that. And that's your, your record in your same as link. Okay. Um, I think the final question is actually a really good one to round off on. And for those that are watching or couldn't make the end of the session, we will be publishing this as a recording. So final question from Christopher Puri. What are the biggest mistakes or gaps in understanding that you see in data architects building their first data vault? Uh, mostly the things that I already mentioned, uh, thinking that you have to replicate the entire raw vault into the business vault, uh, not knowing what pits and bridges are and how to use them properly. And the, the number one top of the line is just completely getting the concept of business keys wrong. Uh, it, it's, people want to reverse engineer their source system and run a, a tool that turns it into a data vault. And I've helped people actually build tools like that. And there's some tools out there that do that. But if you assume the primary key from the source system is the business key, nine times out of 10, you're actually wrong. And that is a, that's a learning that people have a hard time getting over sometimes. Um, and, and all of that backs up to the number one thing that people do wrong is they try to build it without getting any training. That they attend a session like this, they read a couple of my blog posts, maybe they might read my little introductory book, and then they try to go at it themselves without any help from an expert consultant, a mentor, or, or going to uh, the certified Data Vault 2 um, training. You know, I think that, if you're going to go this route, you need to do the investment, just like adopting any new technology. You're not just going to sign up in, to a SaaS service and start using it. Some cases, there's some of them you can a little bit, but any advanced technology, you know, you, you really need some training, right? Um, and so I think that's the number one mistake is somebody looks at this and goes, oh, Hobbs Link, Sandalites, piece of cake. I got it. Yeah. I'm sorry to say I have not met many people where that was actually true. <laughs> I have one question about that before we wrap up. Um, I know a lot of people are, are wondering how can they continue their education on this and where's the best place to start? Uh, the Data Vault Alliance. So uh, Data Vault Alliance, all one word, dot com. Uh, that is the home of, uh, of the Data Vault community headed by Dan Lindstedt, the inventor of Data Vault. Um, there is a free forum there where you can ask questions and get answers from, from qualified Data Vault professionals, but there's also there is a, a list of all of the certified trainers globally, and I know at least one of those is on the call because I've seen her name pop up, um, so I, I highly recommend they do that, and so datavaultalliance.com is definitely the best place to go to get the, you know, uh, the quality of what you're looking for. Uh, and then there's, you know, from there, you'll see there's several certified organizations that teach data vault classes uh, in the U.S. and abroad. And then there's some blogs there, um, you know, news articles, things like that. And then uh, in, I saw uh, quite a few conversations flying by about the Worldwide Data Vault Consortium, which is going to be in Stowe, Vermont, the first week of May. Um, Beautiful place to be that time of year. Yeah, SQL DBM is going to be there. I'll be there. I'm actually participating on uh, two panels. Uh, I'm going to be on a panel discussion with Bill Inman and uh, uh, Dan Lindstedt. And then I'm also giving a session myself uh, to tell some of my worst case scenario horror stories and, you know, what, what's what's happened and what the lessons learned were. Uh, uh, things people should know so that they don't make those same mistakes. And awesome. then, of course, you can you can look at uh, my blog, kentgraziano.com, follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I don't blog as much as I used to, but there's a lot of reference material, a lot of a lot of data vault articles out there that I've written over the years. 
Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you to Kent and Serge for sharing all of this amazing information on Data Vault. This is certainly not the last time you'll hear about Data Vault from SQL DBM. We're getting tons of really great questions. So that kind of tells us we need some more material for you guys on this. Um, so look no, we don't need any more that. material. We just need more time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, more time. Um, more time. The, the best place to hear more about this um, and hear first when we're going to be talking about this again is going to be our LinkedIn page. Um, so search SQL DBM and make sure to follow us. Um, but other than that, I think that's all we have for you guys today. Wish we had some more time, but thanks again to you, Kent and Serge and everybody who participated and asked these really wonderful questions. Um, have a great rest of your day and thanks again for coming. Sure. Bye, everyone. Bye.